Hey everyone, Professor Long here doing your AMP lectures. This video is intended for my human AMP students uh, and part two AMP at Del Mar College. Anyone else who logs in and watches these might glean some interesting information or some insight, maybe a different way to think of things. Um, as you all know, the coronavirus COVID-19 thing has us um, moving away from face to face and not uh, gathering in large groups. So we're moving to an online format. Uh, this is lecture number three in the series of heart videos. Lecture number one was blood flow through the heart. Lecture number two was the conducting system. Even though I kept saying it was lecture one, um, I'm not going to recut them. This is <laughs> this is not as easy as, as it seems. Um, and then this is the third in the series of heart lectures. Um, I left this up from the last lecture. By the way, if you see me wearing the same things, it's because I'm doing several videos per day. And I'm not going to do wardrobe changes like Britney Spears or... Um, I don't know, Shakira or any of those people. I don't really care about that stuff. <laughs> All right, so look, last time we were talking about the conducting system of the heart, we were saying how the SA node will depolarize as the action potential spreads through the, the atria. It also spreads through the internodal pathway. By the time the atria are done contracting, the action potential has actually hit the uh, AV node, traveled through the bundle of his, the two bundle branches in the interventricular septum, hits the Purkinje fibers, and then the ventricles begin contracting. One of the things I'm going to talk about today is uh, the individual muscle cells uh, action potential. We're actually going to go into this in detail. One of the things I did not say about this video, and we'll cover in this next one, is that the SA node, because it naturally leaks sodium and hits threshold, the way that it conducts itself, it actually causes the heart to contract somewhere between for the average healthy adult, between 70 and 80 beats per minute. Um, for, in pediatrics, kids have a little bit faster heart rate, and uh, I'll let you cover that if, if you will go on to nursing school so or medical school or whatnot. <clears throat> the AV node actually depolarizes more slowly. It has fewer leaky channels. Therefore, it hits uh, an action potential or it hits threshold about 75 times. I'm sorry, about 60 beats per minute. But... When the SA node fires, the AV node would take a lot longer time to fire. For example, if the SA node is firing, it's going to do about 75 beats per minute on average. The SA node would cause a firing of an action potential at about 60 beats per minute, more slowly. And we can't have them beating out of rhythm or else we wouldn't have proper blood flow. So what happens is before the, um, before the AV node reaches threshold, the action potential arriving through the internodal pathway forces it to open voltage-gated channels and depolarize at the same rate so that they're both beating at about 75 beats per minute. That causes us our blood flow to be uh, rather normal. I'm averaging it at 75 beats. It's somewhere between 70 and 80 beats for the um, average normal adult. Um, some people have a slightly slower heart rate, some slightly faster uh, depending on personality and genetics and, I guess, their own personal physiology. Um, but those are the average ranges. Now, I'm going to erase all this. This is the holdover from the last lecture. And we're going to go over the individual cardiocyte action potential. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at one individual cardiocyte, one single cardiac muscle cell. And this is all going to be based on laws of diffusion and uh, osmosis diffusion and active transport, sodium ions diffusing into the cell, potassium ions diffusing out of the cell, the sodium potassium pump. <clears throat> but the cardiocyte action potential looks different. If we were to draw, say, a neuron action potential, and I'm just going to abbreviate action potential as AP because I don't feel like writing it out, but the neuron action potential looks somewhat different. We have resting membrane potential at a minus 70 millivolts. We have threshold at about minus 60 millivolts. We hit pass through zero, and then we get to about plus 30 millivolts, right? Now, the neuron will remain at rest unless stimulated. Now, if something causes it to open some chemically gated sodium channels, or maybe mechanically gated if it was a touch receptor or something, then it's going to drift to threshold. That's due to sodium leaking in. Sodium ions are leaking into the cell here. Once it hits threshold, the voltage-gated sodium ions begin opening at minus 60 millivolts and continue to do so all the way through zero 
and there's a little bit of overshoot here. This is all due to voltage-gated sodium ion channels leaking. Now, once we hit plus 30 millivolts, all the voltage-gated sodium channels have closed, and the voltage-gated potassium channels begin opening in here. And because of the concentration gradients, potassium exits the cell, losing positive charge, and we start to rush back towards zero and then minus 70 millivolts. Because the potassium channels close a little more slowly, excess potassium leaks out before they are all shut, and that causes the cell to go all the way down and hyperpolarize to minus 90 millivolts. Okay? And then the sodium-potassium pump will restore everything to threshold. And one thing that's unique about this, and by the way, so this is voltage-gated potassium channels. I'm just going to put volt K plus CH. And then the voltage-gated potassium channels remain open a little longer. Now, this whole action potential lasts between one and two milliseconds or thousandth of a second. It's rapid. Neurons fire action potentials very rapidly. The cardiocyte action potential doesn't look anything like this, and there's a reason, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay? So, let me erase this. Make sure you got it. We're going to look at the cardiocyte action potential, and it's very, very different. <clears throat> when it comes to the cardiocyte action potential, it's going to look way different. I'm not going to measure the milliseconds so much. We will talk about the timing of it, but it's definitely different. Now, it turns out the cardiocytes are actually resting somewhere around minus 90 millivolts. Their threshold is somewhere around minus 70 to minus 75 millivolts. They'll pass through the zero millivolts. They go all the way to plus 30 millivolts. And you know, and all this stuff is, is, is done through what's called the, the Nernst equation or the hodgkin goldman katz equation. And we can talk about... Um, equilibrium constants for all the different ions. And if you go into neurobiology class, you'll do all that. That was my specialty, was neurobiology. But nonetheless, um, these are the numbers for the cardiocytes, okay? Now, as we said in the last video, the nodal cells, particularly the sinoatrial node or SA node, has an excessive number of leaky sodium channels. So it doesn't ride along at rest until it's stimulated. It automatically begins to depolarize. And it slowly leaks sodium into the cell until it hits minus 75 millivolts. And I'm going to put a numbering system on here. I'm going to have to erase some of this, and then we'll, we'll put what the numbers are for. They're actually in my note set. For those of you that are in my class, um, the information is in the note set on page 51. Okay, These are the four steps of the cardiocyte action potential that are on page 51 of my note set. There will also be a worksheet to download. Those of you that don't have access to my notes, it, sorry. Um, but anyway, in step one, it's all due to leaky sodium channels, allowing sodium ions to leak into the cell, making it become more positively charged. Once we hit threshold, though, as you should know, the voltage-gated channels begin opening, and then because so much sodium is going to be rushing in, they all start opening in rapid succession. So that leads to the rapid depolarization stage, and we rapidly rush... To threshold. So everything in blue here is going to be rapid depolarization. And it's really due to voltage-gated sodium channels allowing voltage-gated sodium ions to enter the cell. The only difference between at this point between this and the neuron action potential is I don't need a neurotransmitter or some kind of stimulus here. It's going to naturally leak sodium through. Now, once we hit plus 30 millivolts and all the sodium channels have begin have, have become shut. Then the cell reaches what we call the plateau phase. And if we look at this, excuse me, I'm reaching for a marker. It actually starts to decline in voltage, but not like a neuron. It extends for a long period of time. And this plateau phase, the third step of the cardiocyte action potential, happens because as we open voltage-gated potassium channels, potassium begins exiting the cell, leaving. But at the same time, we open some voltage-gated um, calcium channels in the cell membrane. And calcium is entering the cell almost at the same rate that potassium is exiting. 
remember in, in skeletal muscle, a lot of the calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The same is true for cardiocytes, but cardiocytes also leak extra calcium into the cell through some calcium channels. And because sodium is losing positive, sorry, potassium is leaking out, losing positive charge, but calcium is leaking in, adding positive charge, we only lose a small amount of voltage instead of dropping straight back down. So the plateau phase is due to calcium ions entering the cell at the same time that potassium is exiting the cell, almost counterbalancing each other perfectly. At some point in time, the calcium channels close or some of the calcium gets bound up, depending on which book you read. But nonetheless, suffice it to say that eventually calcium, the free calcium in the cell or the calcium rushing in the cell, be getting, be, uh, it stops. And then the potassium channels remain open. And that's what gets us to the repolarization phase. And then we roll, repolarize all the way back down to minus 90 millivolts. And if you're following in my note set, that's the fourth steps. The first step is depolarization to threshold due to leaky sodium channels. The second step is rapid depolarization due to voltage-gated sodium channels opening and sodium influx, sodium rushing into the cell, increases rapidly. When the sodium channels have all closed and the potassium channels begin to open, letting potassium leak out of the cell, rather than seeing it drop down because calcium is leaking into the cell, counterbalancing that, we see almost this flattening or plateau stage. The plateau stage continues for an extended period of time, and by the time the calcium channels close, then the potassium channels, which are remaining open, return to the threshold. And then the whole thing would start over again. And one thing that's unique to notice, number one, you need to know the voltages. Two, you need to know which ions are flowing in which direction. Um, causing each phase of this. And the last thing you need to know is, unlike a, a neuron action potential, this can last somewhere between around 250 to 300 or longer, sometimes 350 milliseconds. Okay. So this is like 150 times, 200, almost 200 times, between 150 and 200 times longer than the neuron action potential. Now, one of the reasons that occurs is because we're trying to move blood. So one of the examples I give in class is if I had a water bottle in my hand and I just squeezed it real quick, it squirted a little bit of water out, like a muscle twitch in a skeletal muscle. Twitches don't um, result in any useful action. What I need is the atria to contract and squeeze and top off the ventricles with as much blood as they can. I don't want a quick pop or a twitch. I want a sustained squeeze. And then when the ventricles contract, I want another sustained squeeze so that we inject all that blood so that we can deliver blood to all of our cells. So I don't want a quick um, twitch. If I were to squeeze a bottle of water, if I took the lid off and squeezed it, a twitch would get a little bit of water out. But if I squeeze it and squeeze and squeeze, I would inject a lot more of the fluid when I relax there would just be a little bit of water left in the bottle. And that's exactly what's happening here. That delayed squeeze is causing the cells to contract, squeezing the ventricles and ejecting as much blood as possible before they relax again. And in the atria do the same thing, boom, boom. They get a sustained squeeze, ejecting all that blood for proper blood flow to our tissues. You know, you're gonna, if you haven't noticed by now, you're going to notice that a lot of things, um, a lot of our systems revolve around energy consuming foods to gain energy, and then the use of energy by our cells and the continual replacement. So our cells need oxygen and glucose to make ATP, and then they use the ATP as a burnable type of energy to accomplish things like the movement of actin and myosin contracting in muscle cells. So um, the heart needs that sustained squeeze. It needs that delivery of massive amounts of oxygen and glucose to all of the tissues of the body. As blood flows around, delivers the oxygen and glucose, picks up the carbon dioxide, and that's why we went through blood flow to the heart. That's a whole other topic, and I don't want to get into it now because we've already covered it. Nonetheless, I hope the cardiocyte action potential makes sense to you. I hope you understand which ions are flowing where, um, and uh, I hope you had some fun and you learned something from this. Talk to you soon.